Welcome to Decades of Horror, the classic era. I run to death, and death meets me as fast, and all my pleasures are like yesterday. This is episode 97, recorded April 4th, 2021. Gruesome Magazine. <laughs> that was awesome. <laughs> Nicely done. Oh, really? yes. I am your I host, Jeff you Moore. On this podcast, we cover the good, the bad, maybe even the ugly horror films released since the beginning of time through 1969. In each episode, we'll discuss the monster spirits, psychos, and villains that have haunted movie going audiences since the dawn of film history. <laughs> Uh, and I should let everybody know we're part of the Gruesome Magazine family of podcasts, so uh, hook up to our Gruesome Magazine YouTube site if you're listening to this on audio, and uh, subscribe and like and make comments and all that stuff. Um, we include uh, Horror News Radio theatrical reviews, Horror News of the Week, the Gruesome Magazine digital VOD reviews, podcast, Heroes of Droids, and the three Decades of Horror podcasts, the classic era, 1970s and 1980s. All three podcasts. So do that. And if you don't <clears throat> into, if you're not into video, you can still catch us on most podcast apps by looking for Gruesome Magazine and Horror News Radio. All right. With me this week are my incredible co-hosts. Whitney Cazzo, an accomplished artist and makeup artist and writer. Whitney, how are you doing this fine day in April? I'm good. It's good to have Joseph back. It oh, is. <laughs> yeah. How's I, I everybody was doing? Pretending he wasn't here, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that guy. That guy. <laughs> um, we also have Chad Hunt co-host on decades of horror, the 1970s and 1980s. Film producer and director with Freak Havoc Productions and a comic book artist and writer. Hey everybody. How you doing, Chad? I'm doing great. And you sure do have me. And I'm so glad to be here. I so sure glad. You. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also with us is Daphne, the awesome and stupendous costume maker and like Ooh, a Moselle. I thought he was, was going to say yes. something else there. Oh. Hmm. Awesome and stupendous. <laughs> How you Hello. doing, Daphne? Hi, I'm doing great. Doing great. Excellent, excellent. And back with us, huh? we hope, forever. And, and ever. ever. And, and ever. ever. As he runs and, and yeah. yeah. <laughs> It's Joseph Perry, contributing writer to Gruesome Magazine and contributing writer to The Scariest Things, When It Was Cool, Horror Fuel, and Ghostly Grinning Websites, the Drive-In yes, Asylum man. Zine, and <laughs> Diabolique Magazine, and co-host of the Uphill Both Ways podcast, and you just got to episode 100, I saw. Yeah. Yes. Hey, somehow. Cool. Thank you. Somehow. Uh, hi. Yeah, somehow. How you doing? Uh, How you doing? It's, it's really great to be back. I'm doing well. Uh, working on five hours sleep to join you all. So ready Aww. to rock and roll in a foggy haze. <laughs> Which is the best way to rock and roll, I suppose. I see your model and now have a completely blank wall for a background. <laughs> completely <Yeah>. blank. <laughs> uh, right. I, I haven't unpacked my microphone either, so uh, I'll try to do that by the next episode and get some oh, wonderful decorations behind me. It sounds like a, a, a schoolhouse rock uh, episode <laughs> in the making. Yes. Well, the uh, glare from the light above hasn't changed any, so you still have that going. Uh, no glare. No glare. <laughs> I'm trying not to. Anyway. I may glare at you guys, but... <laughs> Um, I we are uh, we are a spoiler podcast. These are this movie is uh, that we're going to do is almost seventy years old. So we're we're going to pretend like you saw it. And if you didn't see it, it's a, currently available on Shutter. A couple days ago, as of this recording, Shutter added the Val Luton collection. For how long we never nice. know. 
So get out there and check it out. There's some great can, films. Can you there. imagine not spoiling a movie that's that old? What the hell would yeah. we? Uh, <laughs> then they they stood around in the shadows and with blank stares and sort of talked like trailer but, reaction. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Our movie this episode is the Seventh Victim. Produced by Val Luton. Director is Mike Robeson. Writers are Charles O'Neill and DeWitt Bodine. Cast includes Kim Hunter, Tom Conway, Gene Brooks, Hugh Beaumont, and uh, some other notables we'll discuss later. Produced by RKO Radio Predictors, Pictures, RKO, blah, blah, RKO Radio Pictures. Uh, filming locations, ooh, RKO Studios in Hollywood. And it was filmed May 5th to May 29th, 1943, and released on August 21st, 1943. Now, I'm estimating the budget just because it's pretty well known, although apparently not because I saw two different sources, that when Luton was hired by RKO, he was given a standard budget for all of these films. And I, I heard, uh, I read something that said 150000 but then I heard something that said 125000 So in that neighborhood was his budget. Domestic box office was $600,000, according to Ultimate Movie Rankings. And the synopsis for this film, a woman in search of her missing sister uncovers a satanic cult in New York's Greenwich Village and finds that they may have something to do with her sibling's random disappearance, also known as her sister. And this is pretty much the standard uh, poster that you find everywhere, although I, I did find a couple of other oddball ones uh, that we'll get to when we get to the uh, um, taglines. Um, yeah, so it says there was, there was a, there was a uh, piece of trivia here that said the first film for uh, producer Val Luton that did not turn a profit at the box office. But I also, also heard that all of these films made money. So I think it probably made money, but I guess there's no way to know for sure. Once you get this old, there's too many discrepancies. Um, there wasn't really any other working titles other than The Victim. That's what it was called for a while. <clears throat> all right. And now, the time we've all been waiting for. It is time. Now is the time on Classic Era when we play Taglines Tag by Chance. <laughs> <laughs> Rockets? <was> great. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. First tagline Slave to Satan. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Second tagline Sister of Satan. And these were these were both plastered in great big letters across the top of the alternate posters. So. Third, third tagline, dysfunctional family of Satan. <laughs> oh, that's not wow. <laughs> Slave to the sister. <laughs> Robbed of the will to love. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That was fun. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 Yeah. Right, that one gets me. <laughs> Devil's cult secrets exposed. Well, not all of them. <laughs> not all of them. Not, not all the all secrets. No. Not, not all of the. You know. Some of, some of the scenes were cut, so they wouldn't have to kill everybody. I think. Mm. Weird <laughs> pagan rites and secret dens of exotic mystery. Beauty <laughs> enslaved to the creed of evil. Loveliness at bay behind a mask of terror. <laughs> See the strangest thrills on record. It's 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 so much better being able to see you. 
Yes. <laughs> this is how the magic happens. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and everybody uh, just said, okay, wow. there must be another video I can watch. Beauty trapped by the dread curse of the devil's cult. Doomed to live under the spell of evil. That's how my Aunt Sarah would read it. <laughs> oh evil. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, am I done, am I done here now? Uh, you're, we're done with those. So now we are uh, going to move to I'm, first I'm with impressions. The you don't have to leave. You can't leave yet, no. Um, <laughs> we're going to go to first impressions, and I'm going to ask our returning long-lost prodigal son here, uh, Joseph. Um, when did you first see this, and what are your impressions? Well... I was really confused by this because I missed the first six films in this series. The first through six <laughs> victims. It's similar with Shakespeare, Richard II. I had no idea what was going on because I didn't see Richard the First. However, uh, I saw this one actually probably uh, quite a while back, more than I care to say, uh, right around the advent of home video. Uh, and when I was, you know, renting all the classic stuff that I possibly could when it was getting released. Uh, and I have not seen it in a long time. I had seen it since then, but not in quite a while. And I'm uh, really glad that whoever chose this for this week did so because I was thrilled to revisit it. Uh, love Val Luton, love film noir, love horror, and what a nice combination uh, this is of all all three of those things. Uh, we'll talk more about uh, elements of it, why. Uh, so uh, probably at least my third viewing and uh, that sh I had forgotten the shocking ending. So that was quite uh, powerful too on this viewing. So I think those are enough initial thoughts and I'll save some more for later. Okay, thank you, Joseph. And uh, next up, I'm going to go to Whitney. Well, have you seen this before? And what are your impressions this time? Yeah. I have not. This is the first time I have seen this. And there were some things that were a little confusing towards the end for me. But I guess we'll we'll um, go into that later. But honestly, it I I really like stories where there's other relationships involved other than uh, like the, as far as the guy looking for the girl, the girl looking for the guy. I, I like seeing where there are uh, siblings when they're trying to uh, touch base uh, and trying to discover what, what could be going on with someone with, with their issues or trying mm -hmm. to um, uh, locate and, a mystery and finding out things you, when you think you know somebody you're you don't based on some of these findings on certain characters and, and I think that's that's what I liked about this one is that when you when you think you know someone and you find out there's there's a little bit more beneath the surface so okay yeah all righty uh let's see what Daphne thinks of this what were your first impressions, Daphne? And had you seen this before? I don't think you had. You said you hadn't dug I into Val Luton yet. Yep. I am uh, sad to say that I haven't seen any Val Luton before this. And um, so I was excited to watch it. I'm super excited that Shudder's got them all there for me to just watch. And um, I really liked it. I watched it last week for the first time. I love the ending. And uh, um, it reminded me of, well, because one of the characters was in a Thin Man episode. So that felt really good and homey because I like the Thin Man. And I loved just all the shadows and the noir angles and all that stuff. And the costumes are really awesome. And um, like what Whitney said, I thought that there was a lot of coolness. I really liked that there's the sister that you don't know anything about and, mm -hmm. and you find out kind of who this person is. This is just someone who's took care of her. She doesn't really know her as a person. So that was interesting. I right. love seeing Beef. Yeah. I loved seeing Beef's dad. And I also kind of was wondering, um, 
hey, is he the bad guy? Like, I kind of was like, who are these people? And is, is there someone trying to lie to her and manipulate her? And uh, I just kind of went went along with all that stuff. It was really fun. I enjoyed it. Yeah, they kind of tried to keep you guessing with some uh -huh. strange looks. <laughs> uh, Mr. Chad Hunt. This is my first time seeing it. And as like Joseph, I was confused because this is the first time or the, not the first time this has happened where I came into the middle of a series. Mm. Like I, I watched, I watched Jaws four before I watched the first three. And I was like, what's the deal with this shark? <laughs> you know, like, so it, made, it, it, it made me, it made me, yeah, it made me go back to the rest of No, I'm just kidding. But, uh, this is pure Val Luton, uh, beautiful, beautiful, uh, Beautifully shot movie. Um, the use of shadows and characters who just appear out of shadows and disappear into shadows. And um, it's just amazing, amazing noir filmmaking to look at. Um, the one scene that particularly uh, stood out in my mind was when uh, Jacqueline was in the one room and she was with the little detective fellow that was trying to help her out who got stabbed. And mm -hmm. how she's how she slowly backed away right. uh, from that, and the lighting in the in that mm -hmm. one scene was just outstanding. It was just outstanding, and how the the, the shadows fell upon her as she as she backed up, and and uh, just great stuff. A great great um, mixture, uh, like Joseph said, of of horror and film noir. Um, although I must say the the Satan worshippers at the end weren't weren't very committed. <laughs> you know, you know the, the one guy just stands there and reads them the Lord's Prayer, and they're like, you know, maybe he's right. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not very committed in their, in their Satan worship. <laughs> you know, and uh, they all hung, hung their heads like fifth graders who got caught <laughs> stealing yeah. milk off the tray in, in class, you know. Um, <laughs> but anyway. But no, it, it's it's a it's a very very good movie, very good. I enjoyed it immensely, and and um, for for a little over an hour long, it it, it yeah. had it had this. Um, uh, I don't know. There was just a fullness, a richness to it, um, where most movies of that, at that time were just almost throwaway type, you know, throwaway little B pictures, you know, for that that runtime and the and the budgets. That they were working with and everything. So yeah, I really, really enjoyed this, and um, surprised I'd never heard of it before until Jeff uh, brought it up that we were going to cover it. So, but yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, good. Um, Joseph, I'm the one that picked it. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> so, well, thank and you. I, Jeff. I tried to warn everybody uh, ahead of time that you know you you got to think of Val Luton as sort of uh, it, it's. It's more about the atmosphere than it is about the effects and the violence. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, sort of, as we did with Cat People, film noir applied to horror. But I, mm -hmm. I like this too, and I think it's got, it's, it has a very, uh, for me, a very downbeat feeling to it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as, as you go through it, it's, uh, you know, the ending is, is, odd um and made me think right so there's this bizarre well i'll show some pictures here later but yeah there's this bizarre room that her sister jacqueline so mary's in the uh the uh i don't know girl school is it a convent yeah, yeah. i don't yeah. know it look look kind of like a church which by the way that stairway was from uh is it magnificent ambersons um, oh the uh and I noticed too, they do, this is part of the cinematography, I think, but they do these, uh, you know, the first time we see that, those stained glass windows, we're, we're looking down the stairway and we get mm -hmm. that perspective. And the next time we see it, we're looking up as Mary's walking to leave. Um, and I don't know if there's any impact, any importance of that, but it just was fun um, to notice that. Uh so yeah, and and so her sister has disappeared, and nobody can find her, and she goes looking for her, and then at one point she sees her, and she disappears again before without saying a single word except 
you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's like, nobody will say what they really mean, but then you find out that there's actually kind of reasons for that. Right. It's, it's, uh, dangerous to say some of these things out loud, but the end, um, well, we'll talk about that later. I won't get into that. Uh, as first impressions. I just, I loved it. I love the acting. I love the cinematography. I love the, uh, the dialogue. And I love all the character actors that they put in, you know, and RKO has all these, these character actors. So, um, let's go on to, uh, some more, um, some other stuff I got lined up here. Uh, so first off, we said this was directed by Mark Robeson and he was part of the kind of the, uh, triumvirate, uh, gosh, sooner or later, I'll get, get these all right. Um, so you had Val Luton and Val Luton's a guy on the right, even though Wise is over his head. <laughs> uh, Mark Robeson's in the middle and Robert Wise is on the left in that bottom picture. Uh, but they were part of the the group of guys that uh, they, you know, RKO said, uh, uh, we're going to get rid of the intellectuals and go for show, basically. Um, and specifically talking about uh, uh, Orson Welles, right? And, and Citizen Kane and Magnificent Ambersons. And so they, they hired uh, uh, Val Luton to come in and produce these low budget horror films and uh, Luton brought with him while well, the first couple that he did were uh, Jacques Tournier. I think he did two of them, but I know for sure he did cat people. Um, and then Robeson and wise were also people that had worked with him when they, when Luton was working for David O'Selznick. So, um, and they had a hand in things like Gone with the Wind. So uh, it's interesting. He was very loyal to these guys. So he brings him in. He gives, this is Mark Robeson's first directing job. Up until then, he had been editor. He had been assistant editor, and then he became full editor. Um, so I, I, I find that interesting. And Robeson had a couple of Academy Award nominations for Best Director. Um, any comments about the direction and just, this whole setup, if you did any reading on that, on, on uh, what was going on at RKO and and Luton's input. Fire away. Anybody. Don't hide. Well, I, it, I, <laughs> I was thinking it might be important to, uh, you know, mention uh, how Robson's hands were kind of tied before we give our directing mm. comments. So, Jeff, do you want to lead with that go ahead go ahead well you're better researched on it than me i mean i can just give us well the thing that i know is is that they were going to give him a bigger budget for this Mm -hmm. the studio had decided oh you did so good with cap people we're going to give you a bigger budget but it it, robeson's not going to direct and luton said he was very loyal to his people and he said well then no you know so that sort of cast him into the b picture mold, you know, where he stayed Mm -hmm. because of his loyalty to Robeson. Hmm. And also because of the budgetary cuts, there were four scenes. Oh, yes. From the screenplay, right? Uh, I mean, I assume they weren't filmed. Right. But anyway, um, that does give the picture more of a disjointed feel. And, uh, I think a lot of viewers, uh, yours truly included, feel like, uh, did I miss something? Or, you know, uh, they're referring, for example, to a second guest visiting Mary, but we didn't see that. But, you know, that's something that you can assume. Well, somebody else visited her. But when we learn, uh, you know, what filled in those puzzle pieces, then yeah, that was kind of important and we probably should have known. So I think what I'm getting at finally here is that I think Robeson did a terrific job with what he had to work with, including those missing scenes we just talked about. But looking at 
what we have on the screen and not thinking about the rest of the history. Uh, you know, Chad brought up the light and the shadow and uh, those are incredible scenes, uh, including the one with uh, one of the members of the uh, satanic cult visiting Mary while Mary was in the shower. And of course, I think a lot of people feel that predates Psycho. And that's what a lot of our minds might go to immediately if, for those of us who saw Psycho before this movie. And, but that's just another beautiful uh, use of it. And the chase scene through the streets. Um, yeah. Had a cat people yeah. feel. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it really did. It had a cat people feel and. Uh, so there's the shower scene, just to interrupt mm -hmm. you for a second. Yeah, oh, thank mm -hmm. you. No, that's not interrupting at all. That's supplementing. <laughs> so, right, look at that. That's amazing. Yes. And uh, we know who it is. We've met this character before, right? Mm -hmm. But rather than just show who it is, the shadow gives it, you know, more of a feeling of evil, I do believe. Mm -hmm. And uh, menace. Well, and, and of course, it start. Yeah, it starts off with her hearing a sound. Right, he hear, She hears yeah. the door open mm -hmm. and yes. close, and it's just. I don't know about you guys, but a little on the presumptuous side, if you ask me. Uh -huh. <laughs> just walk in and start just talking to somebody in. taking yeah. a shower. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyway. Yep. And the chase scene through the streets with Jacqueline is uh, super well done. And mm -hmm. Chad mentioned one of the shots uh, or sequences in that chase scene. Uh, you know, current thinking for some viewers could be, well, she had so many chances to ask people on the street for help or to go into the theater backstage or to stay in the bar where it would have been probably safer, I'm sure, than out on the street with somebody chasing her. But mm -hmm. it still had that uh, kind of element of helplessness. Mm -hmm. Somehow she wasn't able uh, or chose not to ask any of these people for help, which makes you think about that on a different level. So uh, those are just a few of my favorite uh, reasons why I think Robeson did a great job here. Well, and I think just to go a little bit more into what you were talking about with the, the scenes, yeah, there was the scene where they say, oh, aren't you the popular one? Somebody else is here to visit you, and you have no idea who, yeah. who else yeah. visited her. And then towards the end, they seem to know all along, nobody knows where Jacqueline is. Mm -hmm. And at, at the end, they like sort of suddenly know where she is and go grab her. And, and right, uh, right. where we don't really know how they knew that, you kind of have to make an assumption maybe, or, or maybe they're all knowing. But there was a scene cut that explained that. Mm. Um. Anyway, and a little more talk about the good versus evil. But these films were pretty hardcore in that they were uh, uh, stuck at this time frame, right? Yeah. All of the subsequent ones, uh, at least. I, I forget the the uh, length of Cat People, but all the rest of these are around hour and ten minutes, almost mm -hmm. nailed down. Anybody else about Mark Robeson or the direction? I mean, you, you almost can't talk about him without talking about Nicholas Mirosaka, um, who was the cinematographer, who is sort of the uh, one of the unsung cinematographers of the noir mm -hmm. feel and look. He's like Mr. Shadows, Darkness and Shadows. and um, It was, um, to me, it was just mind bending the use of shadow. I mean, I, I've seen noir movies and I've seen, you know, a, a lot of horror movies, but um, I don't know. There was just something about this. And, and this is true. Like in cat people too, the way shadows were used. And we talked about that a lot. Um, but like I said, that street chase scene, um, everything meant something, everything. I mean, when she, when she ran up to the, the back of the theater uh, rear entrance or whatever, um, you thought maybe she was gonna go in at that time, but it was there mm -hmm. mainly just to set up, uh, you know, who was gonna come out later and the, the, the people that were coming out of there later because she moved on from there. 
and got caught, you know, um, it, and that was just, that was pretty, um, pretty smart, pretty smart um, move there. Um, and still with, um, I, can't, I can't think of too many off the top of my head like this, uh, but as we talk, I guess we will. Um, just Jacqueline, Jacqueline herself, as she's walking down an alleyway or a hallway or something, she just looked like a solid shadow with nothing but, but the face exposed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it was just so uh, outstanding. And, and, and so it just really sticks with you. Her whole appearance is, is just um, it's almost startling, you know. Well, she has that awesome haircut, which yeah, is so, yeah. so um, bold and, you know, uh, edge. There's such an edge to it. And then that coat that yeah. she's wearing, it's just almost like a this furry cape. Yeah, yeah you're yeah. right. She's she is a and, shadow. Yeah. Almost to say that, you know, it's almost that's, like all, that. that's that's her uh, that's her existence. Mm -hmm. She's a, just a living mm -hmm. shadow. You know, she doesn't. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like even with the style. Yeah, no, yeah, uh, even with the style, mm -hmm. like like you said about her, um, it's, it's like she is a shadow, but I did notice that with some of the people in the way they were standing or sitting, and mm. I don't know if it's you guys, but I feel like even with the, the members, the cult members, like the way they were surrounding each other in a room or even surrounding uh, Jacqueline, um, when they had her in that moment with that glass and and that sense of control of trying mm -hmm. to persuade her to drink that, it there was a it, it was dark and then you could see it within their style that there was, I mean it was really stylish with especially mm -hmm. with the wardrobe and how everyone had that looming that it was either mm -hmm. illuminating illuminating that kind of thing mm -hmm. with some of the women and then the dresses but you could see that there was more of that shadow like where they're like covering it's like more like mm -hmm. of a metaphoric sense of like they're closing in on her mm -hmm. too i don't know mm -hmm. that's just how i was and, mm -hmm, feeling and the yeah. one the one character and i mean that whole when they're trying to get her to drink Mm -hmm. And mm. the the one the one character that did not want her to drink and um, slap the glass away at the end, she had blonde hair, white <laughs> you know very light right. clothes on, yes. so she mm -hmm. was almost shown as a a beam of light in a in a mm -hmm. room yeah. full of darkness, you know. And that, mm -hmm. that was just mm -hmm. that was a, mm -hmm. that was that was very very well done. Mm -hmm. so. Yes, yeah. I, I need to correct something I said. It I mispronounced his name. Nicholas Nicholas is Musaraka. I think I said Mirasaka. It's Musaraka. Anyway, he's he's an awesome guy. Everything that he does just looks great. I think, um, but I but I like that style anyway. Mm -hmm. I feel like there was a couple of little things that I saw, and now um, after having reading in the notes that there's had so many scenes cut, I wondered if there was a reason for some of these. I just thought they were kind of interesting. Like there was a scene when she was visiting the um, salon or the makeup company and she was talking to the blonde haired woman that you were just talking about, Chad, the, mm -hmm. the kind of angelic um, uh, naive woman. And um, she was getting ready to leave. And then this woman kind of directed her toward the employee exit. Yeah. And, and I was like, huh, you know, and then, but I don't really know that they didn't really, go anywhere with that. I mean, I know that her sister owned that company before and mm -hmm. there was all this stuff, but it was kind of like this really subtle, like, no, yeah, you know, it, I, I liked it that. It did yes. go somewhere. It did go somewhere. Oh, did somewhere. it? Okay. Cause yes. I was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. So I, yeah, yeah, how many that. times are we watching this to notice that? So uh -huh. <laughs> when they're, when, 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 uh, I think her name is Francis, that character name yeah. and Mary yeah. are talking mm -hmm. behind them is this hallway. Mm-hmm down at the end of the hallway and she's smoking and, and, and it's almost like the hallway is almost like the center of the shot. You know, the two mm -hmm. are standing and talking and then she directs her and you see her walk out the employees entrance. Well, when mm -hmm. her and Irving August, when Mary and Irving August go to break back in, mm -hmm. they're going in the employees entrance. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. a little they sign above that. it. And when yeah. they walk in there and look, that's the hallway. So mm -hmm. Apparently, her sister was down at the end of that hallway behind the locked door while she was out there talking. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, down there. I, I didn't catch. I had to. I, uh -huh. I saw it the second time and went, 
wait a minute. And then I had to rewind and go back and look at oh, the beginning yeah. and go, yeah, wow, see? they really set that up. They're really yeah. pointing at that hallway. Oh, man, I didn't get that until just now. Thanks, Jeff. That's that's cool. Hmm. Well, there was a I, I just love the shadow stuff. There was a neat mm -hmm. scene in that same scene where they're back there at night. Um, you see Mary is a little bit more to the forefront and Irving August is lagging behind her a little bit and she's lit from the front and he's lit from the side mm -hmm. and it just creates a really interesting, I don't know, look yeah. silhouettes, you know, and, and the, they're in the shadows from the, anyway. I liked that scene hey. too. I liked the, um, I liked the conversation between them in that scene and kind of the, um, the weight that she carried a little bit afterwards after um, encouraging him to go down there. I thought that was cool. So, yeah, I, I think the directing and the cinematography kind of, kind of go hand in hand in these. And this was awesome. You know, uh, uh, Musaraka was a cinematographer on out of the past, Joseph. Oh, it's been so, a long time since I've uh, connected things like that. So that's amazing. I love that movie. Yeah, if you if you look through his filmography, there's just a ton of great noir films in there too, starting right around. Actually, I think there's an argument over you know when did noir start, but I think it's Stranger on the Third Floor was one that he did with Peter Lorre that mm -hmm. um, is sometimes referred to as starting this whole trend, and it was because of the way that he shot it. You know that at least the dark wow. and light and shadows and stuff. So. Um, although he never really got the full credit at the time other than, you know, I, I think the people in the industry knew, but it wasn't, um, you, you weren't getting many Academy Award nominations for RKO B movies at the time. Regardless. Mm. <laughs> so what about the writing? Anything that you noticed about the writing? Charles O'Neill and DeWitt Bodine. Well, I, I thought the writing for, with the, for this, um, it, it tackled a lot, some ideas and points that, uh, as far as I know, in the 40s, you, you never uh, heard of. It was very, the ending was very nihilistic. And, and I love a good um, doomy, gloomy ending uh, in movies. Um, and the whole film, spoiler, and res resolves with the suicide of, of Jacqueline. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and it's, and this is sort of, this is sort of a carry through of a lot of, of the Val, Val Luton stuff is these characters who are living this nightmare existence and, and, and same with Jacqueline. She, she felt like her life was was meaningless, and she struggled to find meaning. Uh, but in but she was af afraid um, of life almost, and and she only thought she could find peace through death. And and th at the end, Mimi knew she was dying. There was nothing she could do about it. So she makes Mimi makes the decision to. Whatever time I have left, I'm, I'm going to live it, you know. And and she mm -hmm. and and Mimi sort of. Then this is just my interpretation. You guys might have have seen it different, but um, it sort of explores that dichotomy of, of, of Jacqueline. She wanted to die, but she um, then her sister enters the picture again. And she has all these people that come in that that care for her, and and so she she kind of um, gets the feeling that maybe this is worth living or or whatever. Um, so she, that's why she always keep, but she always kept that one room rented with just the chair and and, uh, and, the, uh, yeah. and the noose. So it, it, which I don't know, it, it it came up with some really really dark. <laughs> Uh, psychological ideas that you, you just did not see at the at the end, and and there's some talk as I was reading about this movie that 
Mimi may not have recognized the thud from the room being her um, committing suicide. Mm. But I, to me, it felt like she did mm -hmm. um, as Mimi walked down the stairs and walked out. Um, and it was just two people who realized um, how their lives were. Yeah, and, and, and just they were trying to do something about it. And, and, mm -hmm. So, so uh, we find out early on that Jacqueline has rented this room over the restaurant, the Dante restaurant. And the only thing in the room is a chair and a hangman's noose. Um, and the idea being that she could go kill herself anytime she wants. And somehow or another, they try to explain that she's comforted by having that there. Mm -hmm. for whenever she wants it. And uh, then the, this Mimi is a woman that lives on the same floor uh, as that room and has is deathly ill with something, I don't know, maybe tuberculosis or whatever, but she's always walking around in her robe. Um, Coffee, and I don't know if you, re mm -hmm. did you recognize her? I totally recognized her face, but when I tried to look and see other stuff she was in, I have to admit, I didn't really... Uh, I didn't recognize any of the fil films. I'm pretty sure she's in Cat People. Oh, they did. Say, it did say she was in Val Luton. She was in a few Val Luton movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, she plays like the regal one that uh, sort of recognizes oh, uh, Ar um, Arena as a okay. as a whatever kind of like, creature she is. Says something that. to her in the restaurant. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, as far as so yeah she is she's in a bunch of those yeah i remember that. elizabeth elizabeth russell i didn't i didn't pull a picture out of her but it, it's just a familiar face that you see in a mm -hmm. lot of uh, a lot of these films and uh, i was reading that mimi i don't know if it's true or not but the references to mimi being from mimi from la boheme and um with the uh, the, the character from, from the play and stuff that Chad was talking about made me kind of realize that I really feel like that final conversation that Jacqueline had with Mimi, I felt like there was this total um, connection between them. Like they were mm -hmm. almost speaking each other's voice in a, just in the way that they were interacting and they were ending. I almost felt like they were ending each other's sentences. Mm -hmm. And even though Mimi decided that she knew she was going to die, she was going to live her life the best that she could. I almost felt like Jacqueline needed death in order to live, to enjoy life. So she, so I bought the, I bought the um, explanation of the noose as her being like the only way I can really, really live the life the way that I want to is if I know that I can end it at any time. Mm -hmm. So that gave her this wanting to live life the best, which I can only assume she wanted to do. And that was what her only way to yeah. do that. And so when she was talking with Mimi, they had this like connection where they um, spoke the same language and then they just turned, kind of turned around and went off and did their, did the different way of living. But yeah. I kind of took it that Mimi knew that thud. I don't know if I, if that's true or not, but yeah. I kind yeah. of got that. Like she knew the thud and she was like, okay, she's doing her thing and I'm doing I'm doing mine okay. to die. I'm doing this on my way to dying. Mm -hmm. And um, I thought that was really cool and intense reference mm -hmm. to that kind of stuff. I like that you said that because I wasn't quite sure if Mimi really got it. Cause that confused mm -hmm. me when she stopped mm -hmm. like, yeah. wait a minute. Is she, is she second guessing what's going on? Because that's mm -hmm. making me second guess mm -hmm. too. So that, but then she just continued to go down the mm -hmm. stairs to exit. And I guess, because, well, uh, Jacqueline made her exit. Yeah. <laughs> so, and to throw this on, just so in case you haven't seen this and you're listening to this, this uh, satanic cult that as Jacqueline searched for meaning in her life, she got involved with them and uh, wasn't really happy with it. But they had a rule that if you betrayed them and talked about them to anybody, you had to die. And they expected you to kill yourself, really, because they were another one of their tenets was they couldn't commit violence, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Which I thought was interesting. Uh, well, she, she in her search, she revealed her membership to a psychiatrist, right, Dr. Judd. Um, and uh, 
so they had found this out and decided that she needed to be, she needed to quit. So that's why, you know, they're all surrounding her. Like you were talking about, uh, uh, Whitney mm -hmm. in this room are like, and here's this glass in front of her. Of the right. and they're like, drink they're it, come on, drink her. it. Yeah. Oh, you gotta mm -hmm. do it. You bet. It's very bizarre. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. and she fights them off and leaves only to, yeah. you know, in a way do it on her own terms. Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's, mm. it's very interesting. Now the writers, DeWitt Bodine and Charles O'Neill, uh, DeWitt Bodine wrote and, uh, it was more about a serial killer and they were trying to stop him before they, before he got to his seventh victim. Mm. And, uh, Luton wasn't happy with it. And he went out and brought in Charles O'Neill to work on a, uh, a different angle, so to speak. Uh, the other thing about Luton is he always wrote the final draft of the scripts. And so I've, I've seen on the cat people, uh, criterion Blu-ray, there's a great documentary from Martin Scorsese, uh, about Val Luton and, uh, there's pictures of scripts and he wrote most of these, a lot of these camera shots. And like, he'll even mm -hmm. say, uh, can see so and so's reflection in the water, or so and so is hit by shadow, blah blah blah. You know, so, um, he had a he did have, and, and that may be another reason why he wanted to stick with his own directors because mm -hmm. a bigger name director might not have gone along with that, you know, mm -hmm. wanted their own creative vision. So, the little bit that I, um, have been able to learn about Luton is that it did seem like it was important to him to be involved in lots of aspects of, of his films. Like that's part of the reason maybe why he didn't mind being a B film um, involved with B films. Yeah. The way it was described on that, uh, in that documentary was it, there were two reasons behind him refusing to get rid of Mark Robeson and bringing in a, take the bigger budget. One was, loyalty to his friend, Mark Robeson. The other one was a little bit of fear over, you know, as you become a bigger studio, then you, people start paying more attention and you don't have the freedom that, mm -hmm. that he might've had. So I, I, I love this film. I love the, there's so much in there uh, and talking about, I mean, well, let's, let's take a look at some of the actors here before we get too far into this. Um, so on this, the top picture is uh, Kim Hunter and Isabel Jewell as Mary and Francis. Um, and I thought they were excellent. Uh, and, you know, Kim Hunter is playing a character. I, we don't really know how old she's supposed to be. Hmm. Right. Um, just, just about to get out of school, but they're also giving her to letting her teach like mm -hmm. kindergarten or something like that. Um, and she, in, in reality, was 21, I believe, 20 or 21 when this was shot. Uh, Jean Brooks plays her sister. And it's amazing to me that the picture on the right, or the picture on the left, I'm sorry, is, is uh, uh, a shot from her IMDb bio. And I'm not sure if I saw her in another movie that I would recognize her without yeah. that. Um, oh, it's only her eyes that are yeah. the same there. Yeah. But Kim Hunter. Anybody know what else Kim Hunter was in? Well, <laughs> streetcar named Desire. <laughs> yeah, the Planet of the Apes. Yeah, she Some played Zira apes. in Planet oh, of the Apes. Right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, oh my remember, God. If, you remember, if you remember the Edge of Night, the old yes. The old soap oh opera. yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. yeah. And I do oh remember I did, the, the period when she was in that was a period where I was watching that. 
I was going to say, I'm so disgusted with myself. I love Zira. And I totally, yeah. now that as soon as you said that, that name, I was like, right. oh, that name. It's like I knew the name, but I didn't know who the actress was. Oh, that's so cool. That's so yes. cool. <laughs> it is. A, it is. Ton, a ton of TV. Mm. Yeah. TV stuff. Yeah. She, she, it's interesting looking through her credits because she would go through uh, all through the, uh, well, probably 50s, 60s, and 70s, appearing in, you know, single episodes of TV series. Uh, and then intersplicing them with a with a movie about every five TV episodes or something like that. Um, wow, she was an episode of Rawhide. Yeah, just just about everything. And think about this too: at a time when sometimes you don't get leading roles as an actress because of your looks. What's your image of how old Zero was? Mm -hmm. Zero, the character, and the character yeah. of Zero. Mm -hmm. Uh, ape years or human years? <laughs> yeah, right. At any rate, she was she was <laughs> around fifty while she was yeah. <laughs> she was around fifty while she was playing this character, and I and I, I think it was it, it. I hope this doesn't come out wrong, but I think it's she played it three times in three of those Planet of the Ape movies, and and uh, it was a way to not have to worry about oh man your aging, your aging and maybe not getting the lead roles, you know? Wow! Um, wow! Well, she was on Edge of Night from 79 to 80, and she did 113 episodes then. So, um, as yeah. Nola, Mad Nola Madison. And we have a, we, and I just had to put that one up there the uh, interspecies kiss. <laughs> <laughs> right. For the first human ape kiss on film. <laughs> 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 well, I don't think that's exactly true. <laughs> but right, right. But anyway, um, I like Doc Tari probably. I did leave. Uh, uh, I kind of passed on uh, on uh, this other one. I had another one for for Mark Ropes, and these are the other Luton pictures he did. Mm -hmm. The Ghost Ship, Isle, Isle, Isle of the Dead, and Isle of the Dead, Bedlam. I think those two are on Shutter too. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I think, think Ghost so Ship might be the only one that isn't on Shutter, and it's mm -hmm. it's an odd one. It's not. It's, uh, it's definitely worth a watch, but it's it's uh, you know he they gave the you know, the studio would give him these titles, and he had to make a movie, so. <laughs> Apparently they were really ticked at him with uh, what is it? Is it Curse of the Cat People? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, is that the second one? Because they they wanted a sequel, and, and he went, "Now nah, we're not doing that." So <laughs> he he put some of the same characters in it, but totally different story. Um, and Bedlam's fun one. That's that's on uh, uh, Insane Asylums. Uh, mm -hmm. Boris Karloff is an evil, nasty character that runs the insane asylum and uh um traps this woman in it uh anyway it, it's totally there's nothing supernatural about it any of these whether somebody thinks there is or not let's put it that way um, <laughs> and what was the other one we've so we've done this is the third val luton movie we've done we did the body snatcher or body snatchers. Uh, I think Whitney picked that uh, a while ago with, the, mm -hmm. and that was another thing that Luton wasn't happy with. The studio said, Oh, we signed Boris Karloff. You're going to make pictures with him now. And Luton mm -hmm. didn't like being told what to do, mm -hmm. but it turned out to be really good. They became good friends and, and uh, Karloff really adds an extra dimension to those movies that he's in. So Whitney, I, I've been wanting to ask you. Well, let me let me throw the men up here, and then we can talk about the kind of the relationship. So these are like the three main male characters, I think, mm. right? Hugh Beaumont, uh, the Beeves' dad, um, and uh, this Erford Gage, who played the poet that lived close by and then Tom Conway plays Dr. Judd. And of course, Dr. Judd is in cat people and gets killed. Yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. I forgot about that. So they're, 
there's they kind of change his name with something different in the script, right? So uh, they just decided they should. It would be a neat connection. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know. Um, and uh, Erford Gorge, sadly enough. Orford Gorge, Erford Gage, his own time, uh, enlisted <laughs> in the uh, armed forces right after this, and uh, was killed in the Philippines in 1945. Oh, gosh. well. What about Tom Conway? You guys, what about Tom Conway's background? You remember him from uh, who he's related to, etc. I can't well, think. I saw that he was related because he looks super familiar to me. And when I was looking to see other stuff he was in, I saw lots of references to the Falcon. Is that right? Oh, yeah. And um, okay. and his bro and but it's like I, I didn't see any. It must have been something that I saw, and I didn't know what the movie was necessarily when I was younger. But um, because I know I've seen him before. Isn't he related to George Sanders? Mm -hmm. Yes, they're huh. brothers. They're brothers. Okay. Yeah. And George Sanders got him the, uh, so George Sanders did like three or four saint movies mm -hmm. as the saint. And then, I don't know, switched over to the Falcon. And the first few Falcon movies were so much like the saint that the writer of the saint novels tried to sue him. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think it worked, but anyway, and then I guess he wanted to move out of the B movies or had an opportunity to, and then recommended his brother to replace him as the Falcon. And he's actually the, what happens is the original Falcon dies and, and then there's an episode with both of them. And then the brother comes in and takes over as the Falcon okay. becomes the Falcon kind of. I remember him from a Tarzan movie. Yeah. Um, I can't remember which one off the top of my head, but he's also in, I walked with a zombie, which is also one of the, yeah. Collections that is, is out now on Shutter. I love well, Tom Conway's uh, work with Harvey Corman. Excellent. <laughs> I loved him in the Apple Dumpling Gang. Yeah, he was great. And the Carol Burnett um, show. And we did and his brother. Uh, we've had his brother in a couple of movies. He was in. Uh, oh, this is interesting too. Now that I think about it, George Sanders was in uh, Village of the Damned. Village of the Damned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I believe he was in Psychomania. Hmm. Batman. You're not, not ringing a bell. Anyway, uh, oh, well, that too. But George Sanders had told somebody in the late 30s that at some point when he thought he had lived his life, he was going to kill himself. And he did. Oh. So I don't know. It's kind of weird that they're his brothers in this one. Um, maybe not that much more coincidental, but uh, somewhere in the early 70s, he committed suicide. This episode's really bringing me down, man. Yeah. Uh, oh, I won't even tell you about. Uh, <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Who else killed himself? Yeah, you might as well tell us now. <laughs> Jeff? Um, <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> so Hugh, Hugh Beaumont, right? We all know him as the Beaver's mm -hmm. dad. Right? Mm -hmm. Inseparable. Ward Cleaver. <laughs> That's right. Gosh. It was so, so cool to see him young like that. Yeah, it was. Really, really young, was. yeah. And his style yeah. is totally the same. Yes. He didn't stretch yes. at all. Yes. <laughs> no, he does. He looks... <laughs> 20 years later and he's still does everything the same. So I'm trying to think because she was she was 20. He would have been like uh, not that old, 30, 33, 34, something like that. When this was made. Yeah, but Mary's character the the character <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Take two. The age of the character Mary, as you mentioned, Jeff. Uh, she was like a student. Never mm -hmm. stated, but we don't know. Was that like, uh, you know, one of the academies between high school and university? Right. Was it a high school? Uh, yeah. Uh, there was a, so we don't know. That adds a, a kind of 
odd element to the proceedings right. because you know they are the poet uh, you realizes that he loves mary and he confesses that at the end and she said she'd never been in love before but she knows she loves him too so it, it's with, with just as an unusual, right right right, right. Yeah, right but it adds an odd element to an already bizarre film <laughs> so, a bizarre story i should say mm -hmm. you know so well so what, was... what did you think of that because so so <laughs> Hugh Odd, Beaumont's bizarre. character is supposedly <laughs> married to Jacqueline, right? Yeah. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Gregory yeah. Gregory Ward is married to mm -hmm. Jacqueline, and she disappears. Uh, he also thinks there's absolutely nothing wrong with the fact that he uh, helped her find that room and put that noose in it. He, oh, you yeah. don't have to worry about that. Um, so, <laughs> but then when she disappears and they can't find her, uh, he, like, all of a sudden falls in love with Mary. Well, yeah, happens, short. happens every day. Yeah, <laughs> I know we just all, I know we only had dinner tonight, but I think I'm in <laughs> well, there were, there were certain, and things. I lied to you about being your sister's husband. Yeah. So, anyway, that's true, too. Yeah. Uh, there, were, there, were, there were little things that had happened that irked me in some of. Uh, what what Mary was going through when she was trying to find out what she she was concerned obviously about well, wanting to find her sister and everything and there was a there was one scene in particular where I remember she is sitting there and she ha there's this glass of milk and he, I think it's him he's telling her yes. like that she should yeah, drink, 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 drink yeah like she's a kid and I think she even said I'm not a child mm -hmm. or something to mm -hmm. that effect like her head even went like that. I'll drink my milk when right. I'm damn well <laughs> <laughs> yes. so that, I feel like that scene pretty much kind of establishes a little mm -hmm. bit more of where she's at with her age a little bit because mm -hmm. I feel like that was that was kind of confusing for me too yeah. as her character I'm like well what age range is she and where is she with this kind of relationship that's where is this going with this guy and where she was pretty much yeah. ordered to do that and it was almost like a running theme of like yeah drink, everybody drink kept, this <laughs> everybody yeah. kept treating her like she was like 12 yes or something. yes mm -hmm. I, and, I I texted Whitney something about it. yeah you you need to be here to talk about these idiot men because it yes. seemed like they were just always like, you do stay this, here and that. we'll go take care of it. And actually yeah. what that meant was they're going to go screw it up, you know? Mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. Well, that's kind of how uh, Hugh Beaumont was playing the same character. I thought it was just this kind <laughs> yeah. of uh, fatherly um, patron, you know, dictating yeah. what's best for everything. I also thought it was interesting in the beginning when she finds out that her sister hasn't been heard of for a while and right. she leaves and that other um teacher kind of goes outside and says go into the world and you've got to live life and all this stuff and and it was like i just thought that was an interesting thing to have in the movie almost like go off be yeah. a grown-up live your life yeah i didn't do it you do it you know and then now talking about the questions about her age that was also interesting too yeah. like yeah. it's one woman telling her go and get yeah. out and don't 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 get caught in this regimented don't come back. Yeah. environment, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. Go out and find yourself in danger with a satanic cult. <laughs> exactly. <instead. Right>. Yeah. <laughs> Go find a man to tell you to drink your milk and, yeah. and yeah. Uh, get in your head. Save that yeah. crap for the beef. I'm not drinking any milk. <laughs> well, and actually, that's kind of important, too, because she's leaving this safe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, cloistered right environment, yeah. and goes out into this world where like everybody's speaking in code and hiding things, and everything's yeah. real cryptic. You know, you don't. Mm -hmm. It couldn't be more jarring. Worst satanic cult ever. Worst, <laughs> yeah. absolute worst. Cool symbol, but it didn't look particularly <laughs> satanic. Yeah, that's right. They had a symbol. Look, yeah, look like the. Right. Uh, they were just the giving new, their hand the away Nike. at every possible <laughs> opportunity. They were just giving their hand away. You know, listen here. We're, I know you're taking a shower, but we're a satanic cult. <laughs> we've, yeah. we've killed six and already. I think you should go back to school. Yeah. You yes. need to go back to school and drink your milk. Drink your milk. 
worse. And there's, there's, a, worse there's, there's a theme of, of her and her sister being told to drink things. Drink things yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very annoying. There is. That's yes. Interesting. I don't like it much when people tell me what to do. Yeah. You found Jacqueline? Yes. Yes. What happened? <laughs> told her to drink her milk. Oh my gosh. And she wouldn't. And then we prayed to Satan. <laughs> In our own special way. We're not overtly satanic. <laughs> but we like wearing the, the symbol and the, Making people well, do Chad, things what, they don't want to do. What you said earlier, Chad, about uh, they weren't very committed Satanists, uh, except that, you know, if somebody did mention what they were up to, that person would be killed. Killed. But, <laughs> and, well, even even that, they like, were trying to make the people kill themselves. No, I'm not going to do it. You yeah, do it. <laughs> right, right. You just stand in a circle and go. <laughs> drink it, drink it. it didn't seem more like a high society club of people uh, bored Greenwich Village rich people yeah. Being, yeah. You know, for the next big kick. Right, you know? right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when when they did the Lord's Prayer bit at the end, and like you said, they all hung their heads like guilty fifth graders. Yeah. Did you, you poop on kind of see that? Well, <laughs> poop on this carpet. Well, it's time to find the next kick. What's that going right. to be? Yeah. So. yeah. Well, I think there was a fair amount of this. Uh, you know, isn't isn't wasn't there some uh, interest in the occult going on in intellectual circles at the time? You know, when was the time of Aleister Crowley and uh, right, right, you know yeah. even even the Nazis were uh, thought to have mm -hmm. uh, something going on with that in, in mm -hmm. Germany. So, but, but these guys um, really sucked at it. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, and I, they after five good. hours, yeah, you think, because yeah, she's not going to drink it now. She's never going to drink it. <laughs> yeah, I'm tired. I want to go home. <laughs> not till she drinks this water. Not till. She, Everybody's like, oh. The, it <laughs> Plus, seems, it's interesting. Go ahead, Benny. It seems like the only thing that was really smart about one character in particular about having to be part of a cult was the secrecy that Jacqueline had because of mm -hmm. how her sister found out that she had... Um, Oh shoot! When she was talking to the lady about when Jack, not not Jacqueline, but when her sister was talking about the oh she had sold this already to me mm -hmm. or uh, mm -hmm. who was was it the right, salon? Right. This is uh, Miss Reddy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, like uh, like she, it was like she was surprised that her sister didn't say these things to her. But there was but that's that's all that's already a cult mentality is to retain a secrecy that Jacqueline had already had and she already kept. Yeah, from her yeah. own sister, and and then along with uh, later when you when you find out this weird thing with with Gregory, and he says, uh, "Oh, that was her husband, or I'm her husband." And then yeah, uh, but th that was a different spin. That I don't I don't know that that definitely was was strange to me too. But yeah, it, it's it's strange enough just just that one scene really piss me off i've got to say where he's like telling her to drink her milk i'm like i don't like this guy. yeah no no yeah. and there was yeah. a i thought yeah. there was a bunch of scenes like that that was the most yeah. obvious mm -hmm. one but yes mm -hmm. that one was but no I, I just feel like the the whole thing about who was really good about the secrecy was was obviously her sister i feel like yes everyone else isn't really that great about Ooh. covering their tracks in mm -hmm. some ways but yes the sister is because she is the one that has the the mental and the suicidal uh, tendencies, or which led up to the, like, the well, and, and eventual thing. Not to bring you down too much again, Chad, but the uh, the Bureau of Missing Persons. What a depressing place that was! And oh my god! Oh, oh they my put god. those like they scanned down those three people before they I get know. to her, yeah. her about her yeah. sister, and and uh, that was. I just thought that was what an extra little touch to set the yeah. It's brilliant, but just uh -huh. yeah, really yeah. unsettling. Yeah. Well, even as one person had signed and walked away, another person hopped up and got and walked in yeah, line. Like yeah. there was yeah. a, a waiting list. Ooh, <laughs> waiting like the DMV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh man. I'm next. not saying we'll I'm not saying we'll find them, but you know, your right. your license is good for the next six months. 
I love the private detective too. I thought he was. Funny. Yeah, I like. Yeah. Thank you for bringing him up. Yeah. yeah. So Lou Lubin, correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. He was. He was great. I can't do New York accents, but he was great. <laughs> I love him. He, he, he was that quintessential uh, mm -hmm. PI noir guy. Yeah. That, well, I love yeah. how the other guy, the bigger guy, comes up to him and says, "You know who I am." <laughs> Stay away from this. And he goes, okay. And the, the guy leaves and he goes, hey, give me that file. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not paying. And he got the file attention. like that. Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> well, he's, thought, he's got a kind of a, yeah, yeah. And all he did was take down some paperwork to start with. Um, yeah. I, uh, he had a great line too when he comes, he, when he, when he shows back up, and intercepts Mary in the hotel lobby mm -hmm. and says, uh, I found this stuff out. I went over to uh, La Jesse, <laughs> the, the cosmetic place, and uh, told him I was a health inspector. And so they gave me the run of the place. And yes. then he says, I saw, I saw every room but one, and it was locked. <laughs> I sure would like to know what's inside that room. <laughs> no, you really don't. I mean, you really <laughs> But, but, you know, that's a dark foretelling. Of, yeah. Well, didn't he yeah. say that when he walked back out? Like, I don't want to know anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just about. It changed my mind. Yeah. <laughs> yes. You should have went first. <laughs> and it's also no, interesting, was... going back to the cult quickly, that uh, they said that they didn't believe in violence but it, uh, we don't mind paying an ass assassin <laughs> right. to do the violence for us. I, well, I mean, I assume right, that guy right. wasn't part of the cult. The, the idea I got from that, they said, we decided on no violence this time, but there will be another decision yeah. Yeah. where maybe it would be violent. I don't know if that's yeah. what, if you guys. Well, he that, sort but... of made the command oh, yeah. decision. Uh -huh. to... That's right. So, yeah, well, let's, let's talk about that. Sorry that I just waved at a fly here. <laughs> Oh, but I, I like it kind of gets back to what Joseph was saying about these this line of like elite people are well we'll pay someone else to do the dirty work we wouldn't right. mm -hmm. we're not going to do that mm. but someone else will do yeah. it yeah. right right so mm -hmm. oh there I did I I didn't realize I got that that's that side lit and front lit shot that yeah I, was talking I really about. liked I that I really like that scene liked. I was just going to say, I loved, I just love, I know I said it earlier, but I just love the interaction between those two in the hallway where she mm -hmm. was like getting, trying to get him to go mm -hmm. first and he didn't want yeah, to. And then afterwards she kind of felt, she felt guilty about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> as well as she should. Yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so there Jacqueline sits. Uh, Haircuts by Mo Howard. <laughs> Yeah, with the crystal goblet. Um, hey, hey, I may have asked one. you to drink milk, but at least I didn't tell somebody to go get killed down the hallway. <laughs> so this shot, I really like. Uh, I, I'm ignoring the, the, the fun game. Sure. Uh, this yeah, shot, I, I really we like. Know. We can tell. Uh, well, she's ignoring. between the, uh, the two theater masks, right? The, yes. the, right. The, I, don't, I don't know, laughing and yeah. crying. Um, mm -hmm with her big coat on and she does. Mm -hmm. I, and I think she wears that coat at every single scene, I think, or is there, does she have that on when she shows up at Mary's door or at the door and then goes, Shh, and then I think, I so. think so. I mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what did you guys think about those two, uh, the two detectives that like, Mary or uh, uh, Jacqueline comes to the door and goes, Shh, and then you know, shushes her and then leaves. And Mary goes after her and then comes back in her room. And those guys are sitting in there. Were they uh, the one guy was there? Was he there the whole time? He I must have impression. walked in the back way or something, right? I got the impression that he came. Yeah, oh, gosh, that's a good. I don't think he was in the room the whole time, but maybe he was hanging out there waiting for her to show up or something. I don't know that I they were know. sitting there through the whole interaction, but maybe but that, they were. That was another great shot. There's the shot where she's like, I think that's like a compact mirror or something. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And uh, you see the, the, the guy smoke coming up from the chair. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yeah. Just cool. Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah, and that then, was good. Uh, 
all the people gathered around trying to talk Jacqueline. Drink it. Drink it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And did you notice uh, another cool scene is the scene where, uh, right, or the, or the subway, I should say. Right. With the body? Yeah, with the two. Oh, yeah. 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 They, they, the three oh. men. Yeah. Yeah, because Mary, she they, um, didn't, they didn't count on her being on the train, did they? Right. <laughs> she stayed on the train for a while, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. A couple, moment, couple yeah. times around, I think. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, she exited that cart and then she was looking for help. Yeah. And then went back. Did you recognize the uh, woman that was on the train already when she got on? The mm. couple? Mm -mm. No. You, you know who I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, I saw it in the notes. I totally didn't yeah. recognize her, and I love her. <laughs> it's it's Barbara Hale from uh, Perry Mason. Perry Mason. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. In a, hey, that's two Perry Ma Mason shows references in a row. The that's detective right, right. and now um, the secretary. Perry Mason's in the new Batman. <laughs> oh, you beat me to that. Chad, I'll go into the scene. Yeah, yeah. Perry Mason's the new Batman. Oh, God. <laughs> <Wait a minute. laughs> Well, we got our we got two degrees of Batman in there, hmm. right? To George Sanders, Tom George Tom Sanders, Tom Conway, George Sanders. Yeah. So. yeah, um, yeah. I thought that was interesting. So I know I know who uh, you got to get going, Joseph. We're already over. Um, any last comments before you take off? We're going to do some a uh, little bit of feedback here. Well, I'll just say that uh, if you haven't seen this film before. Uh, it's whether you've seen Val Luton films or not, it's a really great one. Yes, uh, it can be a little confusing because of what we mentioned was taken out, but uh, it stands on its own very well. And that I think even adds a more of an air of mystery to the proceedings. So uh, great performances, uh, incredible cinematography, uh, fine direction, uh, intriguing story and you know we like to um, you know have some humor with our comments and stuff but uh, quite seriously it's a great film and uh, I think this uh, this one and, the, and Cat People would be great places to start if you haven't seen Velvet before and if you have it's a great film to revisit especially mm -hmm. if you forgot about that ending like I did ah yeah uh, and and we just told you about it, so you know, just forget we said that, and then forget it. <laughs> but the way it's it's uh, filmed, but you know that's I what's going to happen we, when. Yeah, when, yeah, it's pretty inevitable from the start, but but shockingly so, you know, especially for a film that time. Okay, those are my final thoughts for today. All righty, it's great to have you back, buddy. Yeah. Thank you. I'm going to need to go teach now. But yeah, I missed you, everybody, too. And I'll yeah. see you next time, also. So good to see you, man. Thank you. Good Thanks to, to the you. time change. Yeah. It's a little bit easier. <laughs> and get rid of some other stress in my life that's now behind me. So let's do it. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Right. Bye, buddy. Bye. Have a good one. Take care. You too. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye. Finally, he's gone. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> He's gonna kill me when he sees me. <laughs> I'm anyway, gonna run off and watch some more Val Luton later on. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, I watched a couple when I watched this on mm. Shutter. There was a uh, little bit of a glitch. They're supposed to be coming out with Isle of the Dead from Warner Brothers. Um. But it's delayed. First, it was Scream Factory, and then uh, Scream Factory didn't, you know, took it off their their schedule, and then it showed up on Warner Brothers. It was supposed to be out a week ago, and now it's, I, you know, who knows? So I, I kind of wonder if there is an issues with the the, right. the copy they have or something. Yeah. Hmm. Um. Well, I you know again we could talk about tons of stuff here and i think i i went through all of our uh all of our pictures in in some kind of mixed up order um 
is there anything else we want to say about this movie other than what Joseph said? I think, you know, people can, this is one of those movies that I know some people that will say it's not horror, but I don't care. Uh, <laughs> it may not be horror, but it is terror. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, it's, I, it's, psych I was, it's psychological yeah. horror. And terror. I was wound yeah. up. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I was wound up during a lot of those scenes, mm -hmm. you know, like when Jacqueline left the place and you knew the guy was waiting for her and there's mm -hmm. all these dark, mm -hmm. uh, or when Mary was, and, uh, Irving August were breaking into the cosmetics, mm -hmm. just all that stuff is mm -hmm. just, uh, there were some moments that make, made you feel uncomfortable and, and scared for Mary. Like, I mean, of course, the shower scene, we didn't really know if that mm -hmm. was just going to be a conversation or something more. And mm -hmm. then it just some of the other things that have centered around her uh, and even Jacqueline, like with with the scene with where she's being chased. And then that mm -hmm. reminds you, it's kind of it, it's it's a cat people feel there's a lot of mm -hmm. shadow play and then people playing with with Mary's head too, mm -hmm. and like yeah, yeah. that that kind of thing. So well, you get. They, I'm sorry. They do no, a great job it. of making you wonder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Everybody that yep. she's talking to, you question mm -hmm. what they're saying. Mm -hmm. You yeah. question uh, uh, Gregory. You know, mm -hmm. you yes. character. You Absolutely. Question, I totally, um, I totally suspected that he was up to something for a little bit. I was like, what? And then yeah. you know. And the same Especially, with Irving August, and definitely yes. with the psychiatrist, right? Mm -hmm. so. yeah. Sorry, sorry, Chad. But. No, I was just uh, going along with you guys. Uh, Hugh Beaumont's character, when he did not tell her that he was Jacqueline's husband, you know, mm -hmm. you, that all automatically sets up a distrust for, for that <laughs> yeah. character. Yeah. Yeah. And so, so there's a lot of that stuff going on in this movie, it, and it, it's a great movie to look at. And uh, it is, it is, um, yeah. There are people that will that will say this isn't horror, but but it it is. It, to, I mean, if you're horror covers a lot of different mm -hmm. genres and a lot of different things, you know, this was a, a horrible like a situation. Of, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I mean, especially the ending. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. oh my what gosh, a, yeah. what a what a horrible yeah. ending, you know. Mm -hmm. But still, very a very entertaining and very thought provoking mm -hmm. ending, mm -hmm. you know. And that's what horror does when horror is at its best when it's making you think, mm -hmm. you know. And it's not just blood and gore and, mm -hmm. and that stuff's fun too. But this, the ending of this, is what stuck the yeah. landing mm -hmm. for me. I also really like the harshness of the ending. Both, I mean, the act act itself is harsh, but just how it kind of came to the swift. That yeah. was her only alternative at yeah. that point you know and she was ready to go she yeah. kind of essentially always had that plan but this was it this is when it was yeah. going to happen yeah yeah mm -hmm. and i love how they incorporated that uh, when they incorporated mimi in there all of a sudden and she um kind of brought a lot of emotion to it and uh i thought some depth to what was happening mm. almost yes. like another another voice or something that kind of explaining a little bit of what was going on um yeah, yeah. And a lot. Some she, of the things she, I read about Mimi too is that she was a prostitute. Mm -hmm. I read that so, too. Yeah. So, so she. Can you imagine back then uh, how hard that life must have been mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, to live? You know, and mm -hmm. um, so it was very. It was very good. Very good character studies. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I like, I haven't watched a lot of film noir, but I always think that they're beautiful, and. This movie was beautiful. Yes. I mean, the like we were talking about the shadows, the costumes, um, the hair and makeup. I just thought it was so um, sophisticated. For I can't really think yes. of another word, but um, very stylish. Yeah. Stylized. It was very stylish. Yeah, yeah. and I mm -hmm. loved. I loved that. I was just. I thought that was so beautiful. Yeah, I love the Mimi character too because she all through the movie, every time we see her, there's just short little clips and she's wearing a bathrobe. Mm -hmm. She's disheveled and unkempt yeah. and mm -hmm. coughing and mm -hmm. covering herself up. And mm -hmm. uh, then in the final scene, she's all dressed up and decided, I'm going to go out and live what I can mm -hmm. yeah. for now. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, Jacqueline, the one that, that looked beautiful and all put together and everything is, is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I love it. 
All right. Ladies and gentlemen, the saddest episode of Decades of Horror, the classic era. <laughs> One of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, <Aww>, Chad. <laughs> even, even, the, even sadder than the uh, sociopathic 10-year-old girl. Yes. <laughs> no, I was pretty happy at that. <laughs> yeah. that. That was wild. We'll just say that. That one was wild. This was timid and tragic. That one was wild. <laughs> <laughs> so uh we have some uh feedback and Yay. this time i pulled some comments from uh <laughs> these are great uh, -oh. uh from <laughs> waiter mass in the pit episode 93 and jay bart says the posters are amazing and they are uh, for the Quater Mass, um, as is the background on the whole series, as always. Uh, thank you for shining the light onto it all. Yep. I don't know who Jay Bart is, but as always, so must be a regular listener. But could it be? Thank Jay you. So cool. Part of the mayo. Part of the mayo. Mr. <laughs> thank you. Mr. or Ms. Bart. Oh, yeah. That guy. Yeah. Duh. Oh, we outed you. All right. Uh, I think that was on, uh, must have been on YouTube. Mm. So this one's from Inspector Trout 99. <laughs> Thanks for writing. <laughs> Fun discussion about a great it. film. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, guys. I also think the music and sound design are amazing. Tristam Carey is credited with the soundtrack. I think I'm not sure if he did the electronic sound effects too, but he was an early electronic music pioneer. So it's possible. Mm. Cool. Yeah. The music in that was just phenomenal. Yeah. Love the music in it. And, uh, you still getting those jokes all the time, Chad? No, I've blocked Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> Dallas Nostromo says. I, I would suggest you guys do the same. Before it spreads. Uh, the Dallas Mr. vaccine. Yeah. Mr. Nostromo says, just listen to Decades Before the Classic Era episode on Quatermass in the Pit. Notice I haven't said Quarter Smash yet, or Craters, or whatever, whatever it was Alistair came up with. I've been waiting to watch this one for a long time until I listened to your podcast and then realized I've already seen it as <laughs> five million years to Earth. Duh! <laughs> I guess you learn something new every day, unless you don't. <laughs> oh, Dallas, you're so good. Your podcast oh, is both entertaining it. and educational. Thanks for another great podcast. So appreciate it, <laughs> nice. Dallas. Thank I'm you. actually I think Dallas in the has same awesome boat. jokes. Yeah, no, I, I I'm in the now. same boat. <laughs> I now. saw it. I saw it as five million years to Earth. You know, in the in the on TV. And then when people kept talking about Quater Mass in the Pit, Quater Mass in the Pit, and then uh, somebody said, well, you know the one with the insects and that? And I'm like, what? And then I knew it was <laughs> the same thing. And lastly, we have a comment from Michael Steinberg, who is known as the found footage critic. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're into found footage, but he has a website. Um and is part of a, a company called Play Now Media with uh, streaming services. Mm -hmm. He says, Quatermass of the Pit, the original black and white miniseries, is one of my favorite classic sci-fi stories. As good as the writing was for the feature film, the original miniseries was 10 times better. Mm -hmm. I felt the feature film simplified the story and spelled things out to cater to a wider U.S. international audience. The miniseries doesn't take viewer intelligence for granted, which I deeply appreciated, especially given the densely packed story. So yeah. I got to watch. Ugh. I bought the series. I bought the Blu-ray for the series. It won't yeah. play on my player. I thought oh, I had an old no. region player. So I, I'm, I'm oh, in search no. of, a, I'm in search of a player that I can watch this on. Mm. Uh, I, I will find one. <laughs> I had one that would play these. I gave it to my grandson. Mm -hmm. 
when I got a new one that didn't play a newer, oh, better one that doesn't play as many. Doesn't games. play as many. Anyway. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks for the feedback, everybody. Uh, more comments. We love your feedback. Um, but that's it for this episode. Every two weeks, we'll be focusing on a special film released between 1920 and 1969. Next up will be one chosen by Chad. Is it my turn already? <laughs> <laughs> Is Jeff frozen or is he just making a... I'm waiting for you to <laughs> say what it is. <laughs> Did I need to stick my finger in my nose <laughs> so you know I was frozen? Next week is Island of Lost Souls. <laughs> yes, Island of Lost Souls. A great, great movie from where... You know, actually, I think <laughs> what we're doing here is we're doing the countdown to our 100th episode by hitting oh. every decade. So we did 1960, Eyes Without a Face, then 1956, The Bad Seed. Now we've done the 40s with The Seventh Victim. Next episode is the 30s, Island of Lost Souls. And, nah, just kidding, we didn't do that on purpose, but it's kind of cool. Oh, that is neat. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. <laughs> Man, you All just right. gave up a big opportunity there to make <laughs> us look smart, and you blew it. <laughs> oh, Lord. Catch us again here in two weeks for another great horror movie of the classic era, as only decades of horror can do it. Say goodnight, everybody. Goodnight, everybody. Goodnight, everybody. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.